Summertime is a good time to listen to stories around campfires, sitting on front porches, and some of the best stories to listen to are ghost stories. These are two stories of strange spirits. The first story comes from Haiti, and I have some kids from Lilja School who are going to help me with this story. This is from The Magic Orange Tree by Diane Walkstein. And in Haiti, when a storyteller has a story, she says, creak, and the listeners say, crack. Once in a pool, there lived a mighty spirit. And the name of the spirit was Tezan. Tezan, fish of the clear spring. Tezan, fish of the deep. Tezan, my friend, my friend, Tezan, Tezan. Tezan, my friend, come to me. Faye Lena lived near the pool of water. And every day, Faye Lena or her brother took a bucket to fill it with water. One day, Velina went to the pool, and as she bent over with the bucket, her gold ring fell off into the water. Ah! <gasps> oh! But suddenly, a great silver and gold fish jumped out of the water. And Velina said, I lost my gold ring. Could you get it for me? And the fish dove down deep, deep in the water and came up with Felina's ring on his nose. And she took the ring from him and she said, my name is Felina, and I come here every day to get water. And the fish said, my name is Tezan, and if you wish, I will take your bucket and take it to the most pure part of the spring and bring you the coldest water you have ever tasted. So the fish took Felina's bucket, and he brought it back to her, filled with pure, cold water. And when Velina took the bucket home, her mother noticed that the water was better than any they had ever had before. And day after day, Velina brought pure water home. But one day, the mother sent the brother to fill the bucket. And the water he brought back was, was muddy and not as cold. Why can't you bring back water like your sister, said the mother. Well, I will follow Velina, said the brother, and I will see what she does. So the brother followed Velina to the water's edge, and he hid as Velina stood on the edge of the water, and Velina sang to the fish. Days and fish of the clear spring, days and fish of the deep, days and my friend, my friend, days and days and days and my friend, come to me. Well, the brother ran home and told the mother, I know what Felina is doing, and I can sing to the fish, too. There is a fish that brings her that pure water. <gasps> no, said the mother. That is an evil spirit that dwells in the water. You must not go back. I will follow Felina. So the next day, the mother followed Felina 
to the water's edge. And again, Velina stood at the edge of the water and sang to the fish. Tis and fish of the clear spring. Tis and fish of the deep. Tis and my friend, my friend, tis and tis and tis and my friend come to me. And the mother began to plot how she would kill Tezan. And Tezan knew that the mother was plotting to kill him. And he said to Felina, your mother will destroy me and you will know that I am dead when three drops of blood appear on your blouse. And Felina began to cry, but the fish said, do not weep, for we will be together in the end. The next morning, the mother sent Felina to the market to sell vegetables. Felina did not wish to go, but she had to obey her mother. And as soon as she left, the mother and the brother and the father went to the spring. And the mother stood at the edge of the spring. And the mother called to the fish. Tis and fish of the clear spring, tis and fish of the deep, tis and my friend, my friend, tis and tis and tis and my friend come to me. But the fish did not come. The water was still. And the mother said to the brother, you sing. Your voice is lighter, it is more like Velina's. So the brother sang to the fish. Tis and fish of the clear spring, tis and fish of the deep, tis and my friend, my friend, tis and tis and tis and my friend come to me. And the fish leaped out of the water and the father took his lasso and captured the fish and with his machete, he killed Tezan. Velina was at the marketplace. She had been sad all day long. And her blouse was damp. She thought it was from her tears. But she looked down, and there were three drops of blood. Velina ran home, and her mother was cooking a great fish over the fire. Felina ran back to the pool of water and she called out to the fish. Tis and fish of the clear spring, tis and fish of the deep, tis and my friend, my friend, tis and tis and tis and my friend come to me. Fish did not appear. Felina went back to her house. She would not go inside. She took a chair and a mirror and began to comb her hair. And she sang her song over and over again, crying all the time. Her brother came out and noticed that her tears had softened the ground all around the chair and the chair was sinking into the ground. He ran into the house, Papa, Papa, Felina is sinking into the ground. It's late at night, you're imagining things. Go to bed, said the father. And the brother came out again. And now, Felina had sunk into the ground, up to her waist. Mama, Mama, come quickly, Felina is sinking into the earth. What are you talking about? What kind of nonsense is this, said the mother. But by the time the mother had come out, Felina had disappeared into the ground, and all that was left of her was her hair. Felina had joined with the soul of Tezan forever. Tezan, fish of the clear spring, Tezan, fish of the deep,
very much. That was wonderful singing. And now we're going to move from Haiti to a different country. We're going to move to Scotland. And this is a story about a Scottish ghost. And the name of the story is The Lass and Her Good Stout Blackthorn Stick by Sora Niklios. In a small fishing village north of Aberdeen, there lived a lad who loved a lass right well. The lad had a boat of his own, and every day he went out fishing, and he made a good deal of money, and he and the lass were planning to get married. Then something terrible happened. A great storm came up and blew his boat this way and that and smashed it against the rocks. Well, it was all the lad could manage to do to swim home. And his bruised body was taken to his mother and father's house. And his parents nursed him back to health. And every day, the lass come to see him. But as his body grew stronger, his spirit grew sadder. He said to her, we cannot be married now. I have no boat. I have no way of making money so we can have a cottage of our own and start our life proper. It matters not at all, said his mother. Marry the lass and move in here with your father and me. Nay, it is not right, said the lad. I must make my own money and buy my own house. Now the lass was sitting, looking out on the ocean, and she was thinking things over as she had a way of doing. And she said to her lad, she said, you could get a boat, a job on another fishing boat, and you could make money, and I could go inland and work on a farm as a servant maid, and that way we'd both be making money, and when we saved up enough money together, then we can get married. I suppose it will do. That's what we'll have to do, said the lad. So the lad packed all of her belongings in a bundle, and she started up to the road, and the lad walked with her. And when they come to the crossroads, he kissed her goodbye, and he said, I have a gift for you. <laughs> it's not a proper gift for a lad to be given the lass he loves of naught but my good stout blackthorn walking stick, but it's sturdy and dependable like your own dear self. So the lass took the walking stick. And she waved goodbye to the lad, and she walked in towards the farms. She went from farm to farm asking for work. No one needed her. And on the second day after spending the night out under the stars, she came to a great farmhouse, a great croft, with many lands around and, and lots of animals. That looks like a fine, rich house, thought the lass. Well, now, truth to tell, the farmer who owned that croft had just a few hours before died. It was indeed a large, rich, wealthy farm. And he had worked there for many years with all of his children and their wives and husbands. And the farm had prospered. But the farmer himself was the only one who took care of the money. None of his children or their wives or husbands knew where he kept the money. And when he'd come home a few weeks earlier and said, oh, I'm sick and like to die, that was all the children could think of. Where did you hide the money, father? But their father wouldn't tell him. He lay there on his deathbed, grinning. And he died without telling him where the money was hid. Well, now, the folk in that part of the country had a strange belief. They thought that if a stranger spent the night with a dead man and the door was left ajar, the dead man would answer to the stranger any question put to him. So the oldest son was looking out the window down the road, and his wife was standing next to him. And he saw the lass coming up to the house, and he said to his wife, look, a stranger. And the wife said, aye, a stranger it is. 
and the lass come up and knocked at the door and asked if there was any work. And the oldest son said, well, oh, her father just died and we're all worn out from taking care of him these past few weeks. We would be much obliged if you would spend the night with the corpse watching over it. We'll pay you a piece of gold and a piece of silver if you'll do that. And the lass said she'd be glad to. And after they talked to her for a while, they realized that she knew not of their strange belief. So they fed her supper. And she sat by the fire with her bundle beside her and her good stout blackthorn stick in her hand. And there was the bed with the corpse on it. And all the children and their wives and husbands come and gathered around the bed. And they were muttering. And the last said, oh, poor things, they're saying their prayers. But they weren't at all. They were all saying, where did you hide the gold, father? Where did you hide the gold? And then they all went to bed. And the oldest son made sure that the door was left ajar. Well, the last sat by the fire. And the hours passed. And the clock ticked. And the fire died down. And then the clock struck midnight. And the lass heard something stirring in the bed. She looked over, and there was the corpse sitting up, grinning at her. <gasps> now lay down like a good corpse, said the lass, or I'll whack you with my blackthorn stick. But just then, a gust of wind came up and blew the door shut. And the corpse lay back down. I must have dreamed it thought the lass. And she sat the night through by the fire. And in the morning, the oldest son come in the door and he said, well, did uh, anything happen in the night? No, not happened. Uh, oh, the door blew shut. That was about it. If you heard something, it was the door blew and shut. Oh, said the oldest son. Well, well um, tomorrow we'll be burying father, so we'd be much obliged if you'd stay another night too, and we'll be paying you the same way, just a piece of gold and a piece of silver. Will you do it? Now, of course, this man had not a penny to his name. He could only pay the lass if she found out where the father had hid the gold. I'll sit another night for you, said the lass. So she ate her breakfast and went to bed, slept the night. day through. They woke her up, gave her supper. And she sat down again in front of the fire with her good stout blackthorn stick. And once again, the children and their wives and husbands circled around the bed, muttering, where did you hide the gold, father? Where did you hide the gold? And they left. And the oldest son took a block of wood and he jammed it into the hinges of the door so it would stay open. Well, the lass sat by the fire. And the hours ticked by, and the clock struck midnight. And once again, she heard a rustling in the bed. And the corpse sat up, grinning at her. Och, now, man, lie back down, or, or I'll have to whack you that I will. And, and the wind blew in through the door, and she tried to shut the door, but it wouldn't shut, for the wood was jammed in the hinges. And then as she watched, the corpse got up out of bed and walked across the room and out the door. Get back in bed, man, or I'll whack you on the backside with my stick. And she whammed at him with her stick, and he reached in back and grabbed hold of the good stout blackthorn stick. And the lass was holding on to the other end, and then the corpse began to run. He ran through the fields, through the moors, through the heather, through the uh, bracken, and they ran all night long with trees pulling at their hair. And the lass ran as fast as she could, but she never let go of that good stout blackthorn stick that her lover had given her. And as the sun was starting to rise, the ghost went back to his farm, back to the room, and sat back down on the bed. And he looked straight at the lass, and he said, In the chimney, under the thatch, 
And I never would have told you if you'd let go of that stick. And he lay back down and looked dead again. Well, the lass didn't know what to make of that. She sat back in front of the fire again. And in come the wife of the oldest son. And she said, did anything at all happen last night? Well, yes, I, I would say something rather strange happened. Uh, your father there, your husband's father, he got up out of bed and he ran me a merry chase all night long. <gasps> Come quick, everybody, says the wife. He, she knows, she knows where it's hid. And all the children and their wives and husbands stood in front of the lass. And she told them everything that had happened to her, except where the gold was hid. Well, now, says the lass, maybe your father doesn't want you to know. Now listen here, says the oldest son. Our father worked hard for that gold, and we all worked hard for that gold, too. Maybe he didn't want to tell us when he was alive, but now we've got no way to pay anything if we don't know where the gold is hid. Won't you tell us? And the lass sat there. And she smiled at him. And he said, listen, uh, I'll tell you, we'll, we'll write, give you 10 pieces of gold for every hundred that we find. Is, th is that good? Put it in writing, she says. <laughs> so they wrote out, the last will be paid 10 pieces of gold for every hundred that we find. Is that good enough for you? Sign it, she says. So they all signed it. And then she said, he told me, in the chimney, under the thatch. And they climbed up in the chimney, and right under the roof, carefully hidden was a tiny cupboard, and inside were bags, and bags, and bags of gold, and they laid them all out, and they gave the last ten pieces for every hundred that they found. She gathered together her gold, and went back down the road towards the sea, and she found her lover sitting on the dock, looking sad out at the waves coming in, and she ran up behind him and threw her arms around him. And she said, look, I've got a bag of gold now. I can buy you another boat, and we can build a fine house together. Ah, oh, the gold's grand to have, said the lad. But it's not as dear as your own dear self. And he had a fine fishing boat, and they built the finest house that had ever been seen in that part of the country. And she had many children, and she often told her children the story of her adventure with the ghost and her good stout blackthorn stick.